you should favor us, that you should love us the way that you do. You made us a little lower than the heavenly beings, and you just favor us in so many ways. And Lord God, we are grateful for that because it's because of you that we can live and we can experience life. Lord, walk with us today. Help us to bring honor and glory to your holy name. Open our hearts and our minds to your words this morning. For they are truth, their spirit, and their life, and are a guide for us. Help us to walk in your ways and in your will. Help us to encourage each other. It's not for sake of our assembling together, as is the head of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as we see you return in the future here, in the near future. Lord, we thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for calling us together. Open our hearts and our minds now to your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles on you this morning, please turn to John chapter 10. We're going to look at the 10 verses, the first 10 verses. I apologize about the top tab. Not really sure why that's happening, but at least if we need help, you know where we can go at the help menu at the top. So, anyways, John chapter 10, we're going to look at the first 10 verses. Let's read them together this morning. Jesus says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the sheep, uh, the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hears his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. When I describe these three adjectives that are about to come out of my mouth, I want you to think about what you are thinking about in, in terms of the picture that comes to your mind. Someone that is weak, someone that is defenseless, someone that is scared, and someone that is without direction. What, what do you think I'm referring to? Obviously, if you're looking at John chapter 10, it is adjectives that you would use to describe sheep. Uh, they are defenseless, they are weak, uh, they need direction, they need someone to follow. But you know what's incredible about that? Is that the Bible uses that statement to talk to us as well. The Bible says that we are sheep that are scattered and we need the help of the shepherd. Now see, as you're sitting in your seat right now, you would say to yourself, well, I'm not really a sheep. You're like, you know, I'm not defenseless, you know, I'm not scared, I'm not without direction. But if you think about it, if you don't have a relationship with the one true living God who is going to direct you in the paths of righteousness, you are defenseless, you are weak, and you are in, in severe danger of being conquered in your soul. That is what the Bible is trying to tell us. That is what Jesus is trying to convey to us regarding His relationship with us is that He is the shepherd and we are the sheep. Let's draw that application out a little bit more. Now think about in our world, think about in our culture, there are so many things which battle for the attention of our hearts. They want to have a place in our hearts. There are things that we desire to do. There are things that we want to be in. So all of these things with our career, with the things uh, that we want to do in the future regarding goals that we want to accomplish, people, uh, you know, someone that we may want to marry, the finances in our life, there are all of these things that are trying to battle for a place in our hearts. Some of them are good things and some of them are bad things. But here is something we need to understand is that if we as Christians do not allow the voice of God to speak into our hearts, we are in great danger. The danger already exists that many Christians, especially here in America, don't want to listen to the voice of God because it interferes with their life plans. Hello. We may come to church, we may sit in the pews or the chairs, and we may say, you know what, I, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus Christ as my Savior, I'm singing these songs. But at the end of the day, do we really want to listen to the voice of God, or do we have our own agenda and plans? Human beings like to kind of do their own thing, and this is what Jesus is trying to warn us about. He is trying to say, you are sheep, 
And if you allow yourself to be led by another shepherd that seeks to destroy you, you are in grave danger. Jesus is saying, you need to follow my voice, you need to listen to what I'm saying, you need to follow my words, because if you do, I will take you in the right direction where you need to be in a right relationship with me. The Bible is giving us an indication here that we need to listen to Jesus Christ, the true shepherd. What's happened in John chapter 9? John chapter 9, Jesus has a confrontation with the Pharisees regarding the Sabbath. And he has this back and forth with them, and they're not willing to listen to him. An incredible miracle had taken place. A blind man was able to see, and yet they say to Jesus, this is the work of a demon. And they question him over and over again. And they even talk to the witnesses. They talk to the man himself who was blind, and they did not want to believe. Why? Because they had their own agenda. And what Jesus does is he doesn't back down. Jesus says, you know what, in John chapter 10, I'm going to show you what it truly means to belong to the shepherd and what it means to walk away from the shepherd. It's what Jesus is trying to do in John chapter 10. He's trying to contrast the true relationship that God has with his followers. And Jesus is saying, you need to stay away from pretenders. There's a lot of symbolism, there's a lot of imagery that is here in this chapter, but it has everything to do with the Eastern context where Jesus was speaking. So I'm going to show you some historical quotes to help you understand this passage a little bit better. Now here's what's interesting about John chapter 10, is that it uses the imagery of a shepherd and a sheep. And you may say to yourself, well, was this something that was necessarily new to them? No, it wasn't. In the Old Testament, God over and over again tells the people of Israel that He is their shepherd, that they are sheep, that they are His people. And so when Jesus starts to speak here, He's saying more than that He's using the imagery of a shepherd and sheep. Jesus is saying, I am the true Messiah that Israel has been waiting for. I am the Messiah who has come to rescue His sheep from these false teachers that are there. Let's begin looking at John chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. The title of the message is, Whose voice are you listening to? Whose voice are you listening to? Look at verse 1 in John chapter 10. Jesus says, Most assuredly I say to you, He who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber, but he who enters by the door is the sheep, the shepherd of the sheep. Now we've talked about this many times before. Whenever you hear the words, most assuredly, or some of your translations may have, truly, truly. What it's trying to give an indication of is that you need to pay attention to what is about to be told to you because it carries great significance. Jesus is saying, pay attention. Look at what I'm trying to say to you. If you're being distracted, you need to look at this important point. Jesus says this, Truly, truly, I say to you, who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. What is Jesus trying to do? Jesus is showing his Jewish audience a contrast between him, the true shepherd, and all the false teachers of Israel. Now, you've got to think about the audience that was there. The Jewish leadership was there when Jesus was teaching. Some of the most prominent people in Israel were listening to Jesus. And so Jesus, when he says, you need to be alerted to thieves and robbers, you've got to think to yourself, that got their attention. Jesus is going directly after them because he's trying to show them how he had, they have wronged his people. Now let me show you the imagery that takes place here. In ancient Israel, each village had a fold where sheep would be kept at night. My question for you, how many of you have ever tended sheep? Raise your hand. Not a single person in southeastern India. Okay, well, I knew it. I knew it. The rainbows, of course. Okay? Um, Susan over here. All right. So you see, you get where I'm going with this. Each village had a fold where the sheep would be kept at night. Okay, number two. The shepherds would graze their sheep in the hills by day and then lead them back to a common area in the evening. Near the entrance, the shepherd would stop each sheep and inspect them before they were let in. Now, I want you to think about this. How many of you are familiar with Psalm 23? Raise your hand. Everyone doesn't raise your hand. You'd be really worried. Okay. All right? You, know, you hear that at funerals all the time, right? I'm always like, why don't you hear that at weddings? You know, it's kind of encouraging. You know, so anyways. So Psalm 23, remember where it says, He anoints my head with oil, right? You remember that? In Psalm 23, some of you are like, I think it's in there, okay? Okay. Uh, Here's what would happen. So as the sheep were coming in, 
to the fall, many times as they were grazing on the uh, hillside, they would go into thorns and thickets and they would end up cutting themselves. So what the shepherd had was the shepherd had a flask of oil, and as the sheep were coming in, he would inspect them, and if they had cuts, he would take that oil and he would rub it over their wounds. So you understand in Psalm 23 what the shepherd is referring to, so okay? So the shepherd would inspect every one of the sheep. Once the sheep were inside the fold, an under-shepherd would lay at the entrance and would only let the shepherd in. If someone wanted to steal the sheep, they would enter another way. So the only way that you would be able to go and steal the sheep is to go through another way. You would climb over this area that was enclosed. You would not go through the main door because the under shepherd or the shepherd was willing to risk his life to protect the sheep. Now I'm saying to myself, if this is a robber versus me and he wants to take my life, you can have all the sheep you want. But you have to think about this. For the shepherds, this was their livelihood. This is how they made money. And so they were going to be protective of their sheep. And so they would hire either an under-shepherd that would lay across there, or the shepherd himself would sleep at the main entrance. You're starting to get a picture of Jesus and his sacrifice for us, and how he is willing to fight on our behalf. A couple other things to note here. The sheepfold represents the people of Israel in the context of Jesus. Furthermore, it comes to mean all believers in terms of what it refers to. But Jesus is here speaking to a Jewish audience. The door represents Christ as the true way in and out of the sheep. So not only is Jesus here a picture of the under-shepherd or the shepherd that lays down his life for the sheep at the main entrance, but he is also the main entrance. That this was the only way to enter into this pen that was there for the sheep. The thieves and robbers represent the religious leaders of Israel. Jesus was speaking about the negative influence that they had on the history of the people, how they deceived them, how they led them astray, how they used the people for their own gain and popularity. Look at Matthew 23, 15. Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, and when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourself. Whoa! Where is that compassionate, soft-hearted Jesus? He has given them the direct truth. Jesus is saying, you are traveling all this way to convert someone, but when they are converted to your worldview, you make them worse because you teach them wrong things. Even in the Old Testament, the shepherds of Israel did not believe the people of God as He had instructed them. Jeremiah 23, verses 1 and 2. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel against the shepherds who feed my people. You have scattered my flock, driven them away, and have attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for the evil of your doings, says the Lord. So here's something that we need to understand. It's not as if Jesus steps on the scene in the Gospels and he looks around and he sees, boy, these guys nowadays are deceiving my people. They had a history of it. Where the shepherds of Israel were not doing as they were instructed to do. If you have read the history of the Jewish people in the Old Testament, it is not a pretty picture. There were faithful kings that were there, but there were also evil kings. There were good priests, but there were also bad priests. It gives you a picture of humanity that no one is perfect. But because no one is perfect, it is important that you uh, allow yourself to discern what the voice of God is. That you stay in His Word. Look at verse 3. It says, To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. I told you already in verse 3, the doorkeeper represents a hired under-shepherd. Someone who was an assistant to the shepherd when he was traveling or resting. This man took that place. Now here's what's incredible when you look at this. In verse 3, the Bible says... He calls his own sheep by name. 
What does that indicate? That there is a personal relationship between the sheep and the shepherd. Remember, when they brought all the sheep, they would bring them to a common area. So you had different shepherds, maybe all of your sheep were put together, but the way that the sheep would be led out to the proper shepherd is by the sheep being able to recognize what? The voice of the shepherd. Extremely important for us to understand. There was a personal relationship between the sheep and the shepherd. Here's why it's important. If you know the shepherd, you know his voice, if you recognize the voice, you recognize the shepherd. It's that simple. If you know who the shepherd is, you will recognize his voice. And if you recognize the voice, you recognize the shepherd. There's really no debate about that. What is God trying to indicate to us? He will allow us to know who he is. And the more time that we spend with him, the more we get to recognize his voice. So the problem isn't that God isn't speaking to us. The problem is we aren't recognizing His voice. It's something every one of us needs to be convicted about. Here's something else. Is that the shepherd always leads the sheep to their destination. Now, can you imagine what would happen if the shepherd took his sheep and said, you know what, just for fun I'm going to go really close to the edge of this cliff. And as I'm walking, I just can't, it would be kind of cool to see two or three of them fall off, okay? You're not going to have the shepherd doing that. That's kind of messed up. That's kind of morbid, okay? He's going to guide them. He's going to direct them properly. He's going to take them to their final destination. And the sheep will follow the voice of the shepherd. You know, when I thought about that point where it says that you always lead the sheep to their destination, I thought about the verse, I believe it's in Philippians, where he says, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. You know what that means? Is that when God's purposes for your life are done, He's going to take you home. That's what it means. If we truly want to live for Him and His purposes and for His glory, if He has begun a great work in us through salvation, if salvation is there, He has a purpose for us in salvation, and He's going to work out everything that He needs to in our lives, in ministering to people, in growing us to be informed into the image of Jesus Christ, and when He has finished that work, He will take us home. We all like to plan as if we have all our lives to think about stuff, right? You know, we plan stuff out. You know, we plan out our retirement, plan out when we're going to go on vacation. All of those things are good. But think about this. When God has done using us for His eternal purposes, someone else gets to step in and take over and carry on His eternal purposes. Yeah. We can trust God in that. Let me share with you a story that happened uh, last week, and it kind of reminded me of this. Uh, many of you know last week I had to go to Maryland for a uh, funeral of someone that was close to our family. And again, I appreciate Tim Roth uh, filling in for me. Thank you so much for that. So when we were there, we were celebrating this, this lady's life. She was 66 years old. Uh, so we are celebrating her life and all these things that she had done. And everybody kept coming up and saying how this lady, she, she served for eternal purpose. She, she didn't think about the here and now. She thought about the eternal perspective of things. And that same week that we were there, I think the second to last day that we were about to come back here, uh, my mom's cousin brother, his brother-in-law, uh, he was in Western Maryland, he was hiking in the mountains, and he had a heart attack. And he died. He was 42 years old. Teenage kids. You know, if he was climbing up that mountain, he was thinking to himself, you know what, I'm going to finish this vacation, and then tomorrow I have to go to work, and then I have these meetings this week. We have no idea when our time on earth is going to be done. So let's stop pretending that we have the future to live for God when He's asking that we live for Him today. Yeah. We're full of excuses as to why we can't live for God. John MacArthur and William Barclay have a great picture of the shepherd and the sheep. He says this, In the Near East, the shepherd went ahead of his flock, to alert to any potential dangers, making sure the trail was safe and passable and leading the sheep to feed in the green pastures he had already scouted. So it is with salvation. Jesus savingly calls his sheep and leads them out of the fold where they are kept. 
taking them to the green pastures and quiet waters of God's truth and blessing. William Barclay says this, In Israel, the shepherd went in front uh, of the sheep and the, and the sheep followed. The shepherd went first to see that the path was safe. And sometimes the sheep had to be encouraged to follow. A traveler tells how he saw a shepherd leading his flock and come to a fort across the stream. The sheep were unwilling to cross. The shepherd finally solved the problem by carrying one of the lambs across. When its mother saw her lamb on the other side, she crossed too. And soon all the rest of the flock had followed her. Isn't that a beautiful picture? You know, there's so many times in our lives that we think, oh, I did it on my own. Right? I came to this, this uh, fork in the road. There was this big, this big divide between the other side. And we say, I did it on my own. No, you didn't. God carried you. You guys remember the two footsteps that are in the sand? You guys remember that? You've seen the, that poetry? It's, it's a true picture. When we look back, we like to say, you know what? Oh, man, I worked so hard for it. This is why I am. What you need to do is to go back and, and see God's faithfulness. Trace God's goodness to you in the past and the fact that He carried you. You see the care that God the shepherd has for His sheep. Verse 5 says this, Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Let me give you another picture of this in the Eastern world. There's a gentleman by the name of H.V. Morton, and I'm, this is the quote that I'm sharing to you. He went to Israel and he observed how these things were occurring. And here's what he says. He was looking and he says, Two shepherds had sheltered their flocks in the cave during the night. How were the flocks to be sorted out? One of the shepherds stood some distance away and gave his peculiar call, which only his own sheep knew, and soon his whole flock had run to him because they knew his voice. They would have come for no one else, but they knew the call of their own shepherd. An 18th century traveler actually tells how Palestinian sheep could be made to dance quick or slow to the peculiar whistle or the peculiar tune on the flute of their own shepherd. Wow! That is tremendous! They knew his voice, so they knew his voice, they knew who the shepherd was, and they could go to him when he called, but they won't listen to a stranger's voice. True believers will not abandon the true shepherd for false shepherd. True believers will recognize error and flee from it by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, there's a lot of people in our world that are deceived today. You see people that are in cults. You see people that are in other religions. And they're trying to figure out what is the purpose and meaning of life. How can I have salvation? How can I make it to heaven? How can I live a good life? And people are struggling with all of these issues. But the true believer in Jesus Christ will recognize error. Why? Because they are listening to the voice of God. So when I am listening to the voice of God, when I am reading what He is telling me, and it permeates my soul, what I can do is when I have this in my heart, I can look at the world around me, and if there is error that is seeking to lead me away from the gospel of Jesus Christ, I will recognize the voice of the shepherd. You know why so many people are deceived? is because they're not listening to the voice of God. Jesus is saying there's no way they're going to listen to the voice of a stranger. Actually, when they listen to the voice of a stranger, they're going to run away from him. They're not going to pay attention to him. True believers recognize the error and flee from him by the power of the Holy Spirit. 1 John 4, 1 through 6. John says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. 
They are of the world. Therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Folks, can I ask you a question? Do you expect the world, based on what we've just read, do you expect the unbelieving world to like Christians? Some of you are like, I don't know. You know, sometimes I'm not offensive. I, just, I don't talk to Jesus, to them about Jesus. That way they don't get offended. You know what? The Bible doesn't really give you that option. The gospel is offensive, is it not? Can you imagine just going up to someone and saying, you know what, you're a sinner because that's the way that God sees you. And if you don't trust in the finished work of Christ, there is eternal punishment waiting for you. Oh really, that's great. Thank you for telling me about that. Not really the reaction that you're going to get. But this is what we need to understand as Christians. Even as Christians here in America, the political system in America is not going to protect us long term. Hello. Some of us are like, man, you know, who's, who's going to get elected as president? What's going to happen at the Supreme Court level? What's going to happen to all these issues? And we talk about this and we put all of our hope in that. And yet Jesus is saying that the only solution for the soul is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And many of us don't even tell one person during the week. Where is our real hope actually founded? Is, is it in, in the world system? Is it in what they're going to promise us and tell us? Or is it in the voice of the shepherd that leads us to the pastures? A few things I wanted to share with you regarding the voice of the shepherd. How do I recognize the voice of the shepherd? Because they, you, know, you hear a lot about people writing books about hearing the voice of God. And sometimes they make it almost, almost into this mystical thing, right? And sometimes they end up bypassing the Word of God and coming up with their own opinions. And many times these books end up making the top ten list at Christian bookstores. Go figure, okay? But how do I know the voice of the shepherd? How can I do it? Number one is this, and I don't have it up here. You need to know the shepherd. You need to know the shepherd. It begins with a relationship with the one true shepherd. If you don't know who he is, if he is not personal in your life, you cannot learn to recognize his voice because recognizing his voice implies that you spend time with him. How many times have you been somewhere like a grocery store and you hear someone's voice and you're like, is that so-and-so? Have you ever done that? You're like, are you kidding me? It's like, I haven't seen that in years, but you recognize their voice. Recognizing the voice of the shepherd, number one, begins by knowing the shepherd. Number two, you got to know his manual. you got to know his manual. This was given to us by much sacrifice from people that came before us. From people that struggled, from people that were in prison, people that were tortured for the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to know the shepherd, you have to know him personally, but you have to also know his manual. Number three, you have to trust his leading. Now this is where we struggle, right? You've got to trust his leading. Many times we're like, well, Lord, I know you said that, but are you sure you don't want to do it this way? You know, we do that, right? We kind of like negotiate with God. The Lord says, you know what, this, this is what I need you to do. Yeah, Lord, but that's kind of difficult, you know? I'm going to lose friends over it. You know, friendships are going to become difficult. Lord, you're asking an awful lot of you. Don't you have another plan? We have to be open to his leading. We need to be able to recognize and correct error in our life. That begins by reflection. That begins by confronting and correcting the sin in our life. I don't know if you do this, but do you ever, before the end of the day, look back on your day and say, Lord, I just really messed up in that area. Anyone done that? I hope you do it every single day. You just go back and say, you know what? I should have just, I should have just been a little bit more careful with that. Uh, I'll give you a good example from my life. This is no secret, but you guys know I have five daughters, okay? It is not easy, I'm telling you right now, and I can speak from experience because none of you have this issue. I have six females in the house, okay? It is difficult to deal with their emotions. I come from the Middle East, okay? We're not good with dealing with ladies' emotions. And so God was like, you know what, who can I torture today? Oh, Dave, here you go. But, but here's 
what many times what happens. The girls will ask me a question, and I'm being firm with them, but their feelings get hurt. I'm like, I can deal with feelings already. But their feelings get hurt. And then Kristen will come and say, you know what? You just need to change your tone up a little bit. And so I change my tone the next time, and it ends up working out great. What I'm trying to say is at the end of the day, we as human beings need to sit back and reflect on our day and ask God, can I be better in this area? And you know what? God will show it to you. And the fact that you're thinking about it means that God is showing it to you. Trust His leading in that area. Allow God to help you improve so that you can be conformed to the image of Christ. You're not always going to win. I've learned that, right? Husbands, you're not always going to win. Wives, you're not always going to win. Kids, you're never going to win, okay? Uh, but what you need to understand is that we can look back and say, you know what, I wasn't necessarily correct. My, my intention may have been right, what I said may have been right, but there was no way that I won them over by the tone of my voice or my attitude. We need to look back and allow God to show us where we have messed up. And lastly, how do I know the voice of the shepherd? I need to stay connected with the fold. See, the Bible never gives us a picture of being a rogue Christian. You know, this thing that you're going to do it on your own. The Bible gives us a picture of being part of the body of Christ. And I guarantee you, if you are struggling with the issue in your life right now, I guarantee you there's three or four people that are struggling with the same issue. But you know what we like to do when we find out that someone has a sin problem? We go, oh my gosh, I would have never known. Oh my goodness, that really surprises me. Folks, we're all sinners in need of God's grace. When you hear that someone has messed up in their life, don't sit there and say, I can't believe that happened. Say to yourself, thank goodness for God's grace. We're all messed up. We're all sheep. But we need to be part of the fold so that we can learn to recognize the voice of the shepherd and to lean on each other for our struggles. Look at verse 7. Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. Here's what he's saying when he says, I am the door. It's an exclusive statement about Christ and the salvation that he offers. Some other versions read like this, I am the true door of the sheep. John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Acts 4.12 Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Again, remember, there's religious leaders, there's teachers that are standing around. And Jesus says, you need to understand that all the way we came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. Let me break down these words for you. What it means to be a thief and a robber, you may say, well, we already know, but let's look at the culture and context here. The word thief, it is one who selfishly seeks his own ends and would avoid detection. Jesus is saying these shepherds, these false teachers, they kind of crept in so that they could deceive the flock. This was happening in the New Testament. When Jesus had ascended and gone into heaven, the apostles spread out. And what ended up happening is many of these false teachers started getting into the churches, but they kind of went under the radar. And they started talking to people one by one and tried to persuade them away from the gospel of Jesus Christ. Who is a robber? Is one who would use violent means to secure his purpose. What, what did the leadership of Israel end up doing to Jesus Christ? They ended up executing him. Jesus said these people are thieves and robbers. A side note here when you think about this, Judas was a thief. He betrayed. He came in under the radar. He was one of the disciples that was traveling with Jesus. And then we have Barabbas who was a robber, someone who used violent means to secure his purposes. Here's something we need to understand. Jesus wasn't saying that the prophets who came before him were deceivers. Jesus was referring to the Pharisees and false teachers who had permeated his own people in order to destroy them. Look at Matthew chapter 23. These verses are packed with a punch. 
if I think about some of the harshest statements that Jesus made against the teachers of the law, it would be found in Matthew 23. It says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous and say, If we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Therefore, you are witnesses against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Wow. Okay, you're trying to win me over, Jesus. Okay, here we go. Fill up, then, the measure of your father's guilt. Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. That on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. And surely I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate, for I say to you, you shall see me no more. So you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Wow. Jesus speaking these words to those who knew the Bible, or supposedly knew the Bible. Experts in the law, the leadership of Israel, and yet Jesus says to them, you are responsible for the bloodshed of all those godly men that came before you. You're deceivers, you have no true salvation. Look at verse 9 and 10 as we finish up here in the next few moments. Verse 9, Jesus says, I am. We looked at what the word I am means in previous messages. Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pastures. A couple of important things to know here. Number one, there is no reference here to ordinances or works in order to be saved. Jesus says, you've got to come through me. You've got to trust in me. You've got to believe in me. No amount of good works is going to get you into heaven. Number two, Jesus is the object and means of salvation. He is the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But it's also to his death, burial, and resurrection that we get to have eternal life. He's the object and means of salvation. Jesus says he will go in and out and find pasture. Christ as our shepherd will only lead us to places that will increase our faith and spiritual life. Let me elaborate on that in just a second. But let's look at Psalm 23 before that. The psalmist says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Look at those first three verses of Psalm 23. They're right before you. You're looking at me right now and saying, I don't feel like God does this for me. You know, you're looking and you're saying, man, Great pastures, abundance, still waters, it's, it's fine, it's protected. He restores my soul, he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. You're sitting here right now and you're going to yourself and you're saying, I don't feel like that right now. How many of you can say that? Be honest, raise your hand. I don't feel like that. Here's what I think we missed out on. Is I think we missed out on the fact that as He's leading us to our final destination, it doesn't mean that we don't go through dangerous terrain and battles. See, it's not like as if, uh, you know, Jesus has His sheep with Him, and then all of a sudden He lights up this hot air balloon, and He has all His sheep in there, and they all of a sudden float over the dangerous terrain, and they land on the pasture. Wouldn't that be nice in our spiritual life? The moment I trust Jesus, everything is just okay. I'd be like the movie Up, right? How many of you have ever seen that, okay? One well, of the best movies ever made, all right? So, but that's not the picture. When the shepherd is leading his people, when the shepherd is leading his sheep, he goes before them, he scouts out the danger that is there, but he also takes them through dangerous terrain. He takes them through the hills and the valleys. He takes them through areas where there are wild animals that can devour them. But when the shepherd is there, when the under-shepherd is working with him, they have full protection. The Bible never promises us 
that we're not going to go through valleys and trials and bad times. But what the Bible tells us is that God is faithful and that He will carry me over to my final destination. The question is, am I looking at the shepherd or am I looking at the terrain? Am I looking at the shepherd or am I looking at all the things that can possibly destroy me? When I read Psalm 23, it is telling me clearly that the shepherd will take me to the final destination where I can enjoy fellowship with him. And I trust him in that. Verse 10 says, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. Have you ever seen a case where this wasn't the intention? Have you ever seen someone break into a house and say, you know what, I just simply broke in so that I can bring you some dessert and some iced tea. Let's just, have, let's just have a quick meal together. That's the only reason I broke into your house so that we can just have a good time. No, he comes in there to destroy. He comes in there to ravage, to, to destroy. He tells me the same thing about Satan is that his plan is to separate every human being from a relationship with God. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose mind the God of this age is blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine in on them. When I look at that word thief in verse 10, thief to me implies someone who comes at an unexpected time with the intention of harming. Be careful, be discerning. What is God's plan? Jesus' plan, and Jesus' desire is to reconcile every human back to God. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21. Every one of you is familiar with this passage. If anyone is in Christ, he's the old new creation. All things have passed away, the old, all things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is. God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, and though through God we plead through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God, for He made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. You know what Jesus is saying to them? These thieves, these robbers, they came in under the radar. They pretended to be religious. They pretended to knew God. And they sought out to destroy you guys. I've come to you in the open. I've shown you all my miracles openly. I've, I haven't backed down from the truth that I'm proclaiming to you. Judge me for my words. That's exactly what Jesus is trying to say. As the crowd is looking on. I'm going to close with this last statement in John 10. This one is a kicker too. Because this is one of those verses that kind of again makes you look at your Christian life and go, is that statement really true? Jesus says this, I've come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. What does the word abundantly in that verse mean? It describes something that goes far beyond what is necessary. It goes something beyond that is far that is beyond uh, necessary. It goes far beyond that. It is not just a reference to eternal life after we die. It is also a reference to the life we live here on this earth. See, many of us are like, you know what, I just can't wait to go home. Right? On any given week, some of you are like, I just can't wait till the Lord carries me home, right? I just can't wait till he comes there. I don't know why I'm speaking with this accent. Okay. So, I just can't wait till the Lord calls me home. That's my Brooklyn accent. So, just can't wait till he calls me home. But Jesus is saying, I have come that they may have life in heaven more abundantly right here. Right now. On this earth. Now, I told you earlier, this is one of those verses you may struggle with. Whenever I read those verses, you know, as a teenager in my 20s, in my mind, I thought Jesus was saying, He's going to give me life, and then I'm going to have all this stuff. He's going to bless me with all this stuff. If, if I know Christ, and I have a relationship with Him, and I have His life, He's going to give me all the desires of my heart. That's how I used to always read it. But what I've come to realize is this. 
is that this life that I have, as a Christian, I have His life living in me. And what Jesus is saying is that He is promising to give me more of His life so that I can influence others with His life. You get what Jesus is saying? He is going to give me more of His life so that I can influence others with His life. So, this has everything to do with staying connected to the shepherd so that we can make His glory known in abundance. I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. The most abundant life you and I can have right now is to be used for the purposes and for the glory of God. That's where the abundance is because everything else that's materialistic is all going to go away. I can have that life of abundance right now. I want to close with this quote from William Barclay. He says this, Jesus claims that He came that men might have life and might have it more abundantly. The Greek phrase used for having it more abundantly means to have a superabundance of a thing. To be a follower of Jesus, to know who He is and what He means, is to have a superabundance of life. A Roman soldier came to Julius Caesar with a request for permission to commit suicide. He was a wretched, dispirited creature with no vitality. Caesar looked at him. Man, he said, were you really alive? When we try to live our own lives, life is a dull, dispirited thing. When we walk with Jesus, there comes a new vitality, a superabundance of life. It is only when we live with Christ that life becomes really worth living. And we begin to live in the real sense of the word. Do you experience life more abundantly right now? Ask yourself this question. Do I have life more abundantly? Jesus is making that promise. I'm going to give you life and you're going to have it more abundantly. What does that mean? Jesus is asking us to stay connected to him. So that he can live out his purposes and glory in our life. This is what he promises. If we don't have it, the issue isn't with him, the issue is with us. Let's bow for a word of prayer as we partake in communion. Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you for your word, Father, that tells us that if we follow the shepherd, that we can completely trust him. Father, many times we are tempted to go our own path do our own thing, but Father, you tell us to follow you. Lord, I do pray that as we partake of communion, that we would understand what you did for us so that we can have that eternal life. That we can understand what it took for you to be our shepherd. Lord, help us to listen to your voice. Help us to follow your voice. Pray that we would not be carried by all the other voices that we hear around us that are trying to gain our hearts. They're trying to distract us, that are trying to get our attention away from you, Father, but we would use discernment and judgment to follow you. Lord, help us to be thankful for this time of communion that we have, where we remember and celebrate the fact that we are sealed till the day of promise, that we have eternal life, that we are forgiven people by the grace of God. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. As we partake of communion, this morning, I would ask that you only partake of communion if you've trusted Christ as your Savior. And as you take of communion, even before we take it, thank God and reflect on what He has done for you. We're going to have a few of the guys come up and help me as we pass out uh, communion at this time for me if you can help me out. I just need one more. If you can thank you, Ted. Lisa's going to sing for us. Just reflect. Have a time of prayer between you and the Lord at this time. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old
uh, hear us, Lord, and you're always our shepherd. And Lord, we thank you for your love, and we thank you for your good shepherd. And Lord, that you call us, and you call us by name, and we might have fellowship with you. And Lord, we just pray for this body, Lord, that, uh, that we might walk close to you, and Lord, you might use us, Lord, at this time, Lord, and that you might use this new building, Lord, that, that, that you give us that, to glorify yourself and to draw uh, um, people unto yourself, Lord, that they might join you and come into a loving relationship with you. And Father, we thank you for all you've done, Lord, we thank you for the word this morning, and go with us this week, we ask in Christ's name.